Why? Good morning. Um, thank you for the introduction, and welcome to our gene editing interview. Uh, my name is Blythe Thompson. I'm one of the medical directors at MedPace. By background, I am a pediatric hematologist oncologist, um, so certainly are very interested in this technology and how it will apply to patients. And along with me, and I'll uh, have everybody introduce myself, themselves, uh, this is Dr. McRae. Hi, I'm Sandy McRae. I'm the new CEO of Sangamo. I joined in June, and I'm a endocrinologist and a physician by training, and I'm a molecular biologist in a past life. I'm Sandra Glucksman, uh, Chief Operating Officer of Editas Medicine. I'm a molecular geneticist by training, and I joined Editas Medicine as it was getting started um, about three years ago. Hi, I'm, I'm Prashant Pali. I'm an assistant professor in bioengineering uh, right here at UCSD. Uh, I'm an electrical engineer and biomedical engineer by training, and my interests are in genome and tissue engineering. Well, thank you very much. Um, so I think we're here to talk about gene editing and um, the science behind it and how, is, how, how it would apply to human diseases. So why don't we get started with a few questions, and then we'll save about five, ten minutes at the end if the audience has any questions. So um, I will, anybody, so how about we talk, start with you, Dr. McRae, seeing as um, you're right beside me. So it seems that gene editing technologies have sort of gone at the speed of light in the past several years. And the concern has uh, been raised, um, whether our regulatory, ethical, and a sort of our infrastructure, do you think that it's keeping pace or is it advancing so quickly that, um, that, they approve, that the, prof, the infrastructure to support clinical trials, can it keep up? So I think that's important and complicated question because we all, we all have a responsibility to the patients that we're going to treat to make sure we put out a, a solution that is safe and effective and they understand what it is that they're getting involved in. And so we need to be very careful and very patient focused and, and to step back from some of the hype and some of the money that's swirling around in this area. Absolutely. Um, at Sangamo, we've been working with the regulatory authorities for a long time, and, and we've had, we have a great relationship with the FDA. They feel themselves to be the steward of medicine and safety within the US, and so mm -hmm. we need to work with them and help them understand what it is we're doing, and help them to help us find a, a sensible and prudent route forward. So we have four products going into the clinic next year, and have only been able to do that through sensible interactions with the agency. So I think there is a route being developed. Um, perhaps we, we help pioneer that. But, but I think society as a whole needs to step back and understand what the promise is of gene editing. Mm -hmm. I think at some point in the future, gene editing will be widely used for a large number of diseases. I think at the moment, it, the prudent thing to do is to think of those diseases for which there is a sensible benefit risk for the patient. So we really should only be applying gene editing at the moment to diseases where the patient probably has no other alternative for which the disease is significant and the opportunity of gene editing could make a substantial change to their life. And I think there is a place for an, an ethical discussion around this that goes beyond individual companies and, and I would encourage groups like, like this to, to stimulate that discussion. And then, um, you know, once you choose which patient we need to have a common uh, understanding of what are the things that are necessary, what's the necessary on target, what's acceptable off target, mm -hmm. how, how these would be best given to patients, and hold a discussion so as each company isn't doing it individually, and we can help investigators choose which trials they want to become involved in. So you raised the idea of on target and off target effect, and um, Dr. Prashant, maybe, um, and there's questions been raised about off-target and the selection of the guide RNA. Do you have thoughts on those on the libraries and how an investigators and companies should be considering as they're designing these um, CRISPR systems? Right. So I think uh, <clears throat> so I think that's a great. Uh, I think you framed it perfectly. Yeah, you've covered everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> so I think. Uh, I think, I think that framing was great, and I think uh, in that context, when we think, think about, say, on-target and off-targets, it basically goes down to how, what's the efficacy of your tool. Uh, and uh, be it Zengfingers or CRISPRs, right. uh, 
or, or, ta or talents or any other new tool that probably comes about, I think really defining on-target and off-target activity is going to be really important. Now, from that perspective, I think there's sort of, uh, like if I were to answer, like, understand your question care correctly, how do we sort of go about defining uh, what is the best reagent right. for a particular application? Uh, I think uh, there are sort of two arms to this problem. One is, if you're looking at it from a therapeutic perspective, then one definitely has the ability to basically just zero in on a particular target region of interest and then just exhaustively assay a whole host of sort of reagents against that target. Uh, and that can be done very exhaustively, and that can pretty much be done in a sort of brute force fashion. Uh, but the other arm to the whole thing is basically, can we even understand the tool just fundamentally better, both from a you know, biochemistry perspective as well as sort of from other perspectives based on how we sort of deliver it and how we engineer it. Uh, I think that's, a, that's sort of a more open problem in the sense. That's, I think, where uh, we need to probably take approaches that entail exhaustively assaying a whole host of guide RNAs, a whole host of talons, or sink fingers, and just sort of systematically understanding the underlying biochemistry. So there's sort of two arms to it. If, if there's a target in mind, we can just be brute force about it and just get the best tool. Uh, but if you just have to understand the basic biochemistry, then I think that's an open problem. Uh, and sort of there's a lot of uh, investment and sort of effort and energy that needs to go, go in that space. Do you think you, that you would ever get to that target safely and then that you would be comfortable taking it to a patient? Or right. so I think, sort of uh, a risk-benefit for each condition? So I think uh, so we have to kind of define what we mean by reasonable off-targeting. Right. right. I think, uh, so there is off-targeting. So when you think in terms of therapeutics, I think the off-targeting is a little bit more complicated. One is off-targeting defined with respect to just the genome itself. Like how many off-targets am I going to have per cell on an average? But on the other hand, when you look at therapeutics, we're looking at organs which have billions and trillions of cells. So, you know, your off-targeting rates that you're thinking about in that context are not 1 in 10 raised to 7 or 10 raised to 9, but it's more like 1 in 10 raised to 15. Uh, and one in 10 raised to 16. So that's, mm -hmm. so basically, as you scale the number of cells, your off-targeting has to be better and, I mean, has to be sort of smaller and smaller and smaller. So it's, so therapeutics, of course, brings in a completely different challenge in terms of uh, mm -hmm. off-targeting. Uh, I think here, too, I think one can define, uh, but, but again, you know, it's not such a lost battle in the sense that I think definitely there's been a lot of improvements, a lot of improving Cas9, improving guide RNAs, sort of really make great uh, specific tools. But not all off-targets will necessarily be deleterious. Mm -hmm. So I think there, are this, there is this sort of balance of, you know, what off-targets can I tolerate and still give a therapeutic benefit to an individual uh, and versus what off-targets are completely unacceptable. I mean, like, for instance, no small molecule uh, drug is without off-targets. Uh, but at the right sort of dosage, at the right sort of concentration, mm -hmm. I think, you know, we weigh the pros and cons and, and we come to some sort of a middle ground mm -hmm. uh, and something that is reasonable and, and efficacious. Sandra, um, so as your company is moving closer to therapy and clinic, have you, um, there's been questions raised about the immune effect of, we just don't really know whether there is um, any Cas9 or, or immunologic effects of these new products and these new investigations in the patient. What is your company doing to get Yeah, so those? we're doing in vivo experiments to determine, I mean, similar to zinc fingers, mm -hmm. you're also bringing a foreign protein. In the case of some species of Cas9s, um, we've seen those bacteria, our bodies have seen those bacteria, right. so the thought is that there will not be an immune reaction. We haven't seen anything deleterious as we've dosed animals, both mice and non-human primates mm -hmm. in different species. We'll do much more comprehensive experiments as, as we enter and do IND enabling studies. Mm -hmm. But at this point, we haven't seen anything that has stopped the program. I just want to go back to also what Prashant has said, and I think we owe it to the field to separate off-target from safety. As Prashant said, I mean, our cells are breaking DNA all the time. Absolutely. These are nucleases that make cuts. The cell repairs it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, there are ways to first design a, a guide RNA. The tools are, are um, getting more and more sophisticated. Then you detect that cut, and then you confirm whether that cut is specific across multiple cell types and or tissues where that cast is going to, you're going to have exposure. So I think it's important for the field that we separate safety from off-targets, because early on, I think people are overlapping, 
and you know, safety is in the context of what of, of real safety, right? Right. Uh, 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 something that has a mutation that has a de deleterious <laughs> effect. Right. So as we move forward with um, with uh, gene there with a uh, gene editing technology, and it may be in a particular organ system or in a somatic mu or in a somatic mutation. Um, how, is there a what is your thoughts regarding the delivery of the vehicle and the delivery of it? So if it's an ophthalmological disease or it's a um, marrow disease, um, as your companies are considering sort of ex vivo or in vivo delivery of this technology? So I think delivery is important. I, I do want to come back about the, the question about safety. Yeah. Having chaired a safety committee as a mm -hmm. big pharma company, mm -hmm. um, it's a very complicated issue. So as we, do, as we and, and I think it's so important we pause and take time to understand it. I think there is, there, I would say there's three layers of safety one needs to consider. There is the in silico, where for each of our assets you can do a, a bioinformatic analysis of where it might bind and reassure yourself that none of those sites are significant. And then there's the in vitro version where you, we now do end capture of all of our our um, ass assets to show where they bind appropriately and to convince ourselves that anywhere they bind off target is either at such low rate or is not in a significant part of the genome. And then one needs to do proper safety studies. So we do conventional safety studies, toxicology studies right. in animals to give us that confidence. But then we're going into patients, and I think we need to go very cautiously in patients and make sure we understand what the consequence of what we're doing. Because it isn't like a small molecule. If we get this wrong, you can't just stop giving the small molecule. We have permanently edited the genome of a patient, and therefore we have a responsibility to do this prudently. And how are you, as you move forward towards patients, what about the longer term? And so how long will you be monitoring? Because we have no idea just longitudinally in time. Is that a plan for all of your uh, I, I think we all, we all have a responsibility yeah. to consider long-term monitoring of our patients. If you were doing this for any form of medicine, a small molecule or an antibody in, right. in pharma, you would have a responsibility to monitor safety for, for the years, the for decades, right. for the life of the drug. And although we are giving the drug once, uh, or the intervention once, we, we have the same responsibility. So we will need to, I believe, track the patients long term, long term. and make sure we understand it. Because if, if you, small changes in risk have to be balanced against the benefit these patients will get. If we are successful in some of the dreams of Sangamo and, and many of the CRISPR companies have, it will be fundamental changes to the patient's disease. And therefore, we need to appropriately consent the patient so as they understand the risk and they understand the benefit. And then we all hold hands and society holds hands with us to make these interventions. Mm -hmm. But we shouldn't undermine the significance of what we're doing. Now to come back to your question about delivery. Yeah. One of the things that I think has, has slowed the field of gene therapy and gene editing is the limited number of places we can get the medicine. Right, and the durability. We can do such clever molecular biology, but if we can't get it to the gene we want, to, in the tissue we want, and, and we're all somewhat limited by liver and eye. Yeah. Uh, I'm really encouraged by some of the work that's now appearing about um, uh, adenoviruses that, or adeno-associated viruses that can cross the blood-brain barrier, mm -hmm. some of the blood-brain barrier peptides that will allow us to cross. And I think that's a bit that will be the biggest change in gene therapy in years to come is where we can go. Mm -hmm. Sandra? Um, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, getting things to the liver is easy. Doing some retinal injections or intravitro injections is doable. There's a lot of precedence. Um, but there's lots of diseases, both neurological or muscle, that need broader <laughs> exposure. We can learn a lot from the ongoing work that is going on in traditional gene augmentation, traditional gene therapy, mm -hmm. to understand exposure biodistribution and leverage a lot of those learnings to apply it to genome editing where in some cases you will only do one dose, not need to redose as in the case of, let's say, even if you use liposomes to deliver, deliver to the liver as you do in the siRNA world, right. you have to redose every three weeks. 
um, depending on the disease. Um, you could envision you dose once or you do a short multi-dosing and then you've edited all the cells you need to. But going back, I also want to, uh, for this audience, which is very broad, um, we owe it to the to the patients, first of all, and to the technology to do what we're, you know, I mean, I think Sangamo is, has been at the forefront of genome editing, mm -hmm. and, you know, CRISPR were the, the, the little kids compared to Sangamo, and we traveled some teenager maybe? Teenagers, <laughs> yeah. I guess for our investors, we're not little kids. We're, uh, <laughs> we're, we're adults, but we're following the tracks of many of the learnings, both from the early days of sort of the research, right. but importantly, conversations that Sangamo has with regulatory agents. The, the comfort around genome editing mm -hmm. as a field is thanks to all the work that Sangamo. But um, so what keeps me up as, at night is not how fast we as companies are going to go, but in the case of CRISPR, I think there's a lot of academic work happening. Right. And, um, and that, you know, there, there could be, we don't want, you know, not 1999 to happen all right. over again, right. where there's so. a death, and it really puts a halt on a lot of the work that, that we are doing to, ad to address genetic diseases that, that are not easily addressable by right. gene therapy mm -hmm. or antibodies or small molecules. I mean, many, what we have to remember that of the, many of the diseases that are working, they're, they're progressive diseases, they're diseases of children, and there is a desperation yeah. to get That's a therapy right. to That's patients. Right. So we are committed to doing things right from the simplicity of designing a guide RNA to getting to the patient, monitoring appropriately, making sure that for that specific target, we're, we're developing the best therapy with the tools that we have, right? The, the field, just like with zinc fingers and with CRISPR, will continue to evolve, right? right? We'll, we'll develop tools to, to control it, to, you know, better delivery uh, right. vectors will exist. Right, and the field will advance as we so move following forward. up on that question, and I think Prashant, you and I had talked. What do you think but, um, all three of you would be the best sort of ideal si system of academic and industry collaboration so that 1999 and you know the, that experience wouldn't, you know, is it? Are we collaborating enough with our academic? Could we collaborate less or more? Prashant, you want to start, and then yeah, sure. I think. Uh, <clears throat> I think definitely having a close tie between academia and industry is going to be critical. Uh, because I think sort of what has been reinforced again and again in sort of just this brief conversation right now is, is therapeutics is not just your genome engineering tool. There are many elements to genome engineering, or many elements to therapeutics. Uh, I, think, I, think, I think we have a fairly good handle on what the genome engineering tool can do. And, and you know, I think we're going to get very sharpened and sort of really, uh, really good at uh, at the molecular itself, level. At the molecular level. But there is this aspect of delivery, I think, which is really the 800-pound gorilla in the, in the room in some sense. Uh, and I think uh, even the aspect of immune, uh, immune aspects that sort of came up. And I, and I think I kind of want to reiterate that aspect uh, briefly because sometimes safety and efficacy don't always go hand in hand. So if you have a very efficacious tool and it sounds like it's very efficient, it may also have, say, more off targets. Right. So suppose I dial down my activity a little bit then maybe I cannot have a single hit and run approach. Uh, then probably what I need to do is I have to probably do multiple dosages mm -hmm. uh, to sort of get a, a sufficient amount of sort of change in the genome that I can see a therapeutic benefit. But then if we have an immunocompetent individual, then after my first round of delivery, the individual has already generated antibodies against both my genome engineering tool right. as well as my delivery tool. Right. So how am I going to get high efficiency of... Uh, you know, repeat, I mean, like high efficacy in my second round or third round and so on and so forth. So I think what I wanted to kind of highlight was that clearly genome engineering or molecular biology is just one aspect. And there are sort of various layers of complexity that we sort of need to sort of uh, still, you know, thread through. And I think in that regard, I think there's a lot of active work going on in academia, a lot of active work uh, going on in industry. And I think they really sort of need to kind of uh, uh, mesh each, you know, sort of enmesh better. And I think, uh, just to sort of give my sort of anecdotal uh, experience, like when I was a grad student uh, and I was sort of, you know, working with stem cells and trying to sort of engineer them, I think at the genomic level, 
I think one of the greatest inspirations for me was actually some of the work that Sangamo continued to publish actively in top journals so to sort of expose the entire sort of tool to the entire public. So I think from an academic perspective, we'd, like, we'd love to sort of see open knowledge in a sense. Like, you know, we want to see all the information out there. It's also a great advertising tool for the company and also sort of a great demonstration of their skills. Uh, what I'm afraid of from an academic perspective are sort of trade secrets. Uh, because I think that holds the field. Mm -hmm. If it's open, it's out there, then I think you know, it allows the academia to build on it, and as well as you know, academic work is open. And I think from that perspective, it allows industry to also sort of leverage the best of what academia has to offer. And so so, so if I could follow both points, I think this is, this is a really, it's a completely different discussion to the one I thought we were going to have, but it, <laughs> two, two, two <laughs> very interesting points. So Sangamo um, benefited from having rock solid IP and the only pe people that really did sink fingers. And we also lost out some hope from it because there wasn't, as there is in CRISPR, lots of people with patents and, um, and, and lots of people can do it and the excitement that that has generated. And I really do empathise with you with the idea that there could be a lab somewhere that is doing an interesting experiment that hasn't quite thought about it in the patient-focused, IRB-focused way that, that needs to be done. On the other hand, I think Sangamo, um, yeah, there was a wonderful peak year in 2005, 2010, where there was lots of um, you know, state-of-the-art publications. And then we went away and focused on the other things you need to do and on preparing INDs. And, and one of the roles I'm taking as the new CEO is, is encouraging them to publish again and talking about the new generation of zinc fingers, which is so much better than most people have, have any idea of now. Uh, because we have a responsibility to the science. I think in the future there won't be zinc fingers or CRISPR or talons. There'll be gene editing. And there'll be a whole a variety of ways of doing it. And for different tasks, you'll use one technique and for others, you'll use another. And we need to work with academics and with the other companies to discover where best to use it. So it, so it is a partnership between academics, the various companies, the regulators, and patients and, and those who will eventually be the patient support groups that will eventually um, have, have, have to make the choice of using these technologies. Sandra, so, so obviously um, CRISPR obviously is everybody's playing with it. So do you have comments about sort of the academic industry? Yeah, no, we from day one, um, especially a company where we're working on multiple therapeutic areas, right. it's difficult to have all the biology expertise mm -hmm. and, and we built the company as a technology company early on. Um, but, but from day one, it was focused around applying our technology to various um, therapeutic areas. Mm -hmm. So the trajectory to go from the molecular biology to a patient, you've, you need to interact with academics that mm -hmm. have the right models, clinicians that understand the disease and what you're, what you're trying to, mm -hmm. to target, mm -hmm. not target with respect to um, the target itself, but what is the clinical benefit the that name? you have, mm -hmm. uh, impact, clinical impact that you want. And, and we've been pretty strategic about the collaborations, the academic collaborations that, that we formed. Mm -hmm. uh, one that we're very proud of is a collaboration with Luigi Naldini's lab in Milan. Um, it's a conversation we've had with him since we launched the company. And here was a targeted approach of somebody that has broad expertise on, on developing, developing drugs. Strembellus, which is the first cell therapy approved in Europe, came out of his group. And so we saw this as an opportunity to leverage his expertise in drug development and biology and combined it with, with our, um, our molecular biology expertise. And, and the way that we ultimately formed the collaboration was by showing the data that we had generated and the promise and the simplicity and, and the opportunities that CRISPR provided. And, and we've done similar co uh, collaborations across various therapeutic areas. It takes time, mm -hmm. and, um, but you want to do it in a targeted okay, fashion. Well. Following up on one of the uh, things that you had said, the role of patient advocacy groups. Mm -hmm. And so certainly, uh, for these, most of these targeted therapies will be for that rare disease or the patient who has a huge need, especially pediatrics who are orphan and rare diseases. 
In your experience, and um, open it up, is the patient advocacy group um, uh, subjective, objective enough that they can help in guiding our, these advances, or how does it work well, and how does it not work so well in your experience? That's a really good question. You know, and if, it can if we always all, get it, kind of messy sometimes. But if we all sit back, <laughs> and if, you know, if, if you or I had a child with, yeah. with hurdler's disease or, or, or a relative that was about to go blind, yep. you'd you would be out there. You'd be out there and you'd yes, want to. you would. Um, and so these are vulnerable patients but how with do passionate, it safely? passionate parents. Advocacy groups, I, I was at the... Um, the MPS conference in Germany just a couple of months ago, and you were sitting in the audience watching scientific presentations with children in wheelchairs beside you. Right. And, and it brings that, it home. That sense of urgency mm -hmm. to, to do something they can't wait. needs to be done prudently mm -hmm. because um, we, need to, we can't have a mistake. We can't drive forward into a patient unless we're absolutely mm -hmm. sure. And then there's a second bit that having worked on oncology for a while that we'll all need to be careful about. The first time any of us show that this is successful it and there's a benefit to patients, we need to be prepared for requests for use, for compassionate use, yep. for how we yep. make this available and mm -hmm. who we make it mm -hmm. available to mm -hmm. and, and are able to fulfill our societal, societal responsibility that it isn't just for the patients that get you to registration, it's for all the other patients that are to come. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a very complicated world. I've seen it in my previous world in oncology and they've had to go through this and have come up with very clear SOPs and policies right. how to do it. And smaller companies can struggle with that because you may not have more than the supply that allows you to do your phase three. Right. You may not have thought about the manufacturing that will allow availability of, of vector and, and inserts or the at a larger scale. Or, or the patient or the patient. How are you going to make it available? The geographic do make, need. Do you make it available in the US? Do you make it available if Globally. someone in another country yeah. asks for it? Yeah. So I think those are things where I hope we can get together with our friends in the CRISPR companies and start to talk about this together. So as we're all ready to do it, to and it. we become much more patient focused. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see the the role of patient advocacy as uh, groups as critically important, um, as, especially in CRISPR, and I'm sure in the early days uh, of Sing Finger it was the same. There's anything in the news, um, and I get those emails. Yes. So, yes. you know, if there's anything in the news about Can an I ophthalmology target that we're working on, mm -hmm. I will get that week. 20 emails around another target. And yep. it's like, first researching, do I know that target? And then, um, you know, and I've even had conversations with eth ethicists. How do I, I feel for the parent that is writing the email, but I can't make promises, right? right. And it ultimately ends up being a very simple email saying, Un unfortunately, we are a research stage company. We're not working in that space mm -hmm. right now and I wish you all the best in mm -hmm. finding the right therapy. But, um, and, but there is, we have an obligation to educate people both about the promise of our technology, but also the fact that from designing a guide RNA to getting it into the clinic, Mm -hmm. and, and approved for treatment mm -hmm. is many, many years. And this is where the patient advocacy groups can help. And I can tell you, for example, we have a close relationship for Foundation for Fighting Blindness. They have a database where they want to track patients with different genetic mutations. And so when patients come to us requesting something, there are the sequence. I send them to them and yeah. say there's a retina tracker. And so that... You know, it's tit for tat. Uh, FFB supports us right. in, in helping us, you know, be it a uh, medical advisory meeting, let's bring the right people together, let's bring patient advocacy patients with, um, ultimately when we're carrying out the clinical trial, they'll be critically important to exposing the company to, to patients. So that there's an opportunity for industry, academia, and patient advocacy for all of them to play a, a very critical role. I, uh, you had, I had mentioned also the global globalization of these products, um, of these investigational products. And there's um, certainly there's uh, four clinical trials when I last look in clintrials.gov in China. 
in um, human malignancy. With You've obviously had a lot of discussions with the FDA, and I'm sure that all of you have with sort of US-based regular, regulators. Do you have a sense that this is a, oh, this is a silly question, but it seems like this is a global need, and I don't know if we ever could get along with all of our other partners, but is this an opportunity, or how do we address this sort of global regulatory challenge? We may be able to figure it out in the US, but as we globalize these investigational products, it seems like that's a, a sort of a monumental challenge. It is. So one of my previous roles was to run emerging markets R&D for GSK. And so I spent a lot of time in, in countries beyond the US. Right. And if you think there's, I don't know, 300 million odd people in the US there's and 7 billion <laughs> elsewhere. <laughs> over, a billion, <laughs> over a billion in China. And, yeah, and, um, there's a lot. And the Chinese regulators are trying to encourage innovation and there are, are you know, very good investigators in China that Absolutely. will eventually apply their Absolutely. technology to this kind of problem. And when you look at rare diseases, the multiplication really is globally, so most of these patients are elsewhere. Right. So I th we're starting in the US because we feel we have the most control of the patients, the investigator, and the, the, the agency yeah. discussion. Right. Not control of them, the no, control of the discussion. discussion. We're also branching out to include Europe mm -hmm. in, the, in the coming few months. Um, but as I say, our intention is this, is this has to be a global solution. I, I think it would, be, uh, it would be inappropriate to go to some of these less developed regulatory environments now. And since I've joined Sangamo, I've pulled us back so as we focus on the US mm -hmm. and Europe. Mm -hmm. But we need to be prepared to think about how this is a global solution. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the supply chain, the investigators, the patients, they exist in many of these countries, and I'm sure very quickly after we get this registered in the US, we will be heading global. Because one would have to wonder if, some, you know, if an advance or something happened in, in a less developed regulatory structure, would that impact Absolutely. development here? So Absolutely. it could go awry elsewhere, and then there would be sequelae. Well, you have to report within the Absolutely. agency, you have to report global Absolutely. safety databases. Right. And, but, you know, I, I really want to be absolutely clear, there are top-class investigators in Brazil, in China, mm -hmm. in India, in Russia. I mean, there's absolutely. people that we should be working with mm -hmm. all around the world. I think, uh, uh, I think sort of the aspect I really wanted to emphasize in this sort of discussion is, like, is, uh, is the fact that I think... Like we discussed patient advocacy before, and I mean, there's definitely going to be there's definitely going to be variations in the regulatory, you know, uh, agencies and sort of different uh, different sort of uh, uh, you know, geographical you know locations in the world. But I think the aspect that if we can really educate or continue to sort of put forth, uh, you know, every aspect about these genome you know, engineering tools, uh, is I think kind of is really going to be important because I think what the uh, you know what the public really fears is if something just creeps upon them. If, on the other hand, we were always open about all the pros and the cons of an approach, then it doesn't come across as a surprise. And I think that... Or being hidden. Yeah, or yeah. be hidden. So I think this aspect of not just creeping up on somebody, that is, that is important. And Absolutely. I think... Uh, so definitely the regulatory agencies are going to play a role. But I love the fact that a lot of the genome engineering, uh, the entire genome engineering community is, is sort of almost immediately zeroed in on ethics and safety as sort of two major Great. aspects to mm -hmm. consider. Mm -hmm. And these discussions have begun way before almost any therapeutic interventions. I mean, there are definitely therapeutic ongoing clinical trials and things like that. But this discussion is already front and center. And I think continuing to sort of spread this discussion and sort of really widen uh, the scope of these discussions is going to be critical. And I think they're, again, engaging the patient advocacy groups and, and really telling them the entire spectrum of, of what this tool will bring about mm -hmm. is going to be important. It's like looking at a label of a drug in, at home, like an aspirin bottle, and knowing what your, you know, don't take it before a meal and things like that. I mean, it's not going to be at that level of granularity or that sort of level of, you know, but at least, you know, knowing that, oh, well, you know, I should be aware about these issues and these issues and, and things like that. So. Yeah, and I want to expand on what Prashant said. I think it will be, would be very, very challenging to have regula regulations that are harmonized worldwide. Yeah, that, would, that would be a challenge. Slow things down. 
But I think we have an obligation as companies and ultimately anybody that's doing work to be transparent. And we can take an example of what happened with the CAR-T work and patient that died just recently. Mm -hmm. That did not halt the field. No. The, the company immediately analyzed what happened, very publicly stated, and the field continued. So that was a perfect example of being open, honest, and transparent. Everybody almost took their breath, <laughs> right? And Hope then, they as well. <laughs> and and I think it's is for us to be careful about what we're doing, understand what we're doing, so that if something happens, it'll be transparent. It will be transparent, and we can understand. Absolutely, right? Yeah, exactly. Although well, the CAR T one, I think, is interesting because. Oncology of course. Gets, away, gets right. away with Oncology can cope with a different benefit of risk course. to some of the, the things we're looking at. Right, but the field is hot, the right? Field, yeah. And it, it didn't really affect the field as a whole. Um, well, we have a, f a few minutes left, and if we could um, maybe open up to the audience if anybody has questions for our distinguished panel. Oop, there's a hand raised. Um, you may have to stand up, or we maybe we can get your mic. You. And if we could turn down the lights a little. Cause, Please. Because they're quite glaring. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll try without a mic. Lovely. Um, so, uh, Dr. McRae, a question for you. you. You spoke about the responsibility to um, follow patients for safety for the duration of the treatment, which in the case of gene editing could be as long as their lifetime. And, and others spoke about the importance of of responsibility and safety. So the NIH RAF and the FDA in the earlier days of gene therapy, say the 1990s, recognized that responsibility. And most protocols included long-term follow-up. And very few patients had long-term follow-up because the investigator's grant would run out, he would move to a different university and no longer be there, the company would go out of business or be sold. So if that is a responsibility, and you'd like to learn from those patients if there's long-term adverse events, how do you go about ensuring that, that those data are collected? It's a good question, and, and um, long-term follow-up of patients on small molecules and antibodies is equally as difficult, and it's only possible in certain jurisdictions. I, I feel we have a responsibility to do it. I want to know what happens to the patient. I want to know, are they continuing to express? Did they have any adverse events? Were there any antibodies developed? I'm interested in it. It's not just that I feel it a responsibility. I'm interested in it because it will drive what we do in the future. So I think we need to form a relationship with the investigator. But as you say, investigators come and go and with the patients themselves. So as we have a long-term database and can go back to these patients and take it on as our responsibility to find them, to ensure that they remain uh, well and unharmed by what we do. It's, it's not a question to me. Yeah, and certainly as uh, CROs, it's certainly within our responsibility as we contract with industry and with academia to use every tool possible in our current digital age to actually follow the patients longitudinally as best we can, um, but using the more novel technologies. Um, you know, maybe it's an app or, so the CRO is certainly, um, certainly also responsible for that information to come back. Absolutely. Yeah. Another question? In the dark. <laughs> um, I have a question that was raised during, a, we gave a, a webinar about do-it-yourself CRISPR or gene editing, <laughs> which uh, I was like, okay, and your home lab. Have, have you heard of, um, of anybody considering this? Because, you know, as I mentioned, the internet is out there and you can sort of do it yourself. We're do, people are doing do-it-yourself stool transplants, so I guess you could try this. Have you heard of so such technology? <laughs> I mean, I, I definitely see a very widespread adoption of some of the genome engineering tools. How particularly widespread? The CRISPR tool. <laughs> uh, it's almost so easy. ubiquitous in the sense that it's such a democratic tool. It's, yeah. it's reduced a complex experiment to something like a high school experiment. Oh, dear. So that makes it uh, really that approachable. And uh, I mean, I think that's also the power of the system in the sense that it also multiplexes innovation. So I look at it from that perspective, that more people trying it means there's more innovation. Yes, it yes. comes in with With risks. great power comes great. <laughs> yes, and I think especially with, you know, with biology, you know, we, we don't understand enough of biology to know what are the consequences of what we end up doing when we tamper with biology. It's like, you know, we can all light a fire, and it, but we know but that the fire engine will come and it'll douse the fire. Yes. So we know a solution to a fire, but 
what biology can do and what, what you can do with it, it's, you know, we're still understanding it. So I think that, that's where the risk of the t system comes about. It's like we don't know what the tools can enable. Uh -huh. uh, so I think definitely there's going to be a lot of, uh, again, this continued discussion here and beyond is, is just going to be so critical uh, because it's such a democratic tool. And Very I cool. Think, All right. Well, I think um, we're There's a question the over there I see. Oh, a I hand. can't. Can you see a hand? I can't see a hand. I see a hand. <laughs> I don't see a face. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, we heard about from all of you the uh, challenges with a therapeutic versus just learning about the chemistry of the guide or the tool itself and how the risk profile is very, very different. So as you think about how you're evaluating your tools for developing therapeutics, where do you see the opportunities to validate the tool itself in an ex vivo setting before you take on the delivery risk? Can you compare and contrast both? Is it a means to an end, or are there opportunities for therapeutics from an ex vivo use of the tool itself? Yeah, so we have ex vivo work going on both in HSCs and in T cells. We're working with Juno on the CAR T space. And so for therapeutic purposes, it's not just a, a tool. We're developing drugs, um, editing those cells. Um, for us, sort of the ex vivo, remember that these guide RNAs, sim the same is true, um, is uh, for sync fingers will only cut human DNA. And so how do we translate from a cell culture and in surrogate animal models, transgenic animals that have the sequence, but we're also putting in place ex vivo like organoids or explanted, we're taking explanted retinas um, from humans to be able to edit very quickly because those retinas don't stay alive for a long time to show that we are actually doing the edit that we want at the right place, so looking at efficacy, and if we have enough tissue, we also look at off-target. So we're you know, developing new models to translate, new models, new paths to do that translation so that when we do go to the patient, we have confidence that we're doing the right type of edit. I, I would agree. So Think Fingers have now been in about 200 patients. Um, we have 70 patients, I believe, in HIV. Um, we, make, we actually make zinc fingers for the mice, for the non-human primates, and for the humans, because they're, they're subtly different, to try and test them in each model. But it's only when you go into patients that you, that you can really show what, what's happening. And, and I would agree with you. The T cell ex vivo, the, the question there is the logistics of the supply chain, rather than it being simply about delivery or, or editing. Well, uh, we're two minutes over, so I don't want to uh, keep anybody from their subsequent sessions. I want to thank our members for answering all the questions and thank the audience for your attention. Thank you very much.